Greg Barnson's Attack on the Holy Spirit. Banson wrote, We come into this world cognitively conditioned or prepared to recognize the indications of our Creator in nature and scripture. Note, all quotes in this video are taken from Van Til's apologetic readings and analysis compiled by Barnson. So, Barnson says, unbelievers can understand the Bible. Such a statement is not a slip-up. In fact, it is very consistent with his system. Banson says that the unbeliever already knows God deep down. If that's right, then it logically follows that unbelievers have the ability to judge the Bible. For example, imagine a member of your family, whom you've known all your life, writes an autobiography. You'll be competent to judge the reliability of the book, right? To continue the analogy, now the Bible is God's autobiography. So if unbelievers have known God deep down all their lives, then they're going to think they are competent to judge the Bible, right? Why do we need the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible when we already know the being who wrote it, they can say. The apostles always had to combat people who thought they understood God apart from the Bible. Surely, the apostles tried to convince men they did not know God deep down by nature. A man convinced he is ignorant of God by nature will know he is unable to judge the Bible. Paul declares, The thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Believers have received the Spirit who is from God so that they may know the things given to them by God. Compare Paul's words with Greg Barnson's. Human beings come into this world as the image of God. They are already conditioned to recognize their maker as he is revealed in the world around them and in their intellectual and moral constitution. Because we are created as the image, reflection, of God, we come into this world cognitively conditioned or prepared to recognize the indications of our Creator in nature and scripture. The believer and unbeliever are not of different intellectual wavelengths. Hmm. So, we never be able to recognize God in the Bible unless we first knew God deep down in our own hearts. This is similar to a quote from Van Til, I'll soon show you, where he says that the Bible would come to us in a vacuum if we didn't already know God deep down. If we didn't have the foundation of the knowledge of God in us, then we'd never be able to recognize God in the scripture. But this raises the question, if our knowledge of God in the scripture is founded on our knowledge inside us, then what's the knowledge inside us based on? Furthermore, Barnson says we need to be prepared and conditioned to recognize God in the scripture. But whatever happened to the creative power of the word itself? Didn't James say we're born again by the word? And Peter says we're made partakers in the divine nature by the promises? Paul said we're begotten by the gospel. Whatever happened to the creative power of the word? Since when did the power of the word rely on man already knowing things? Can't the word in itself create knowledge? Doesn't 1 John say God gives understanding? That understanding is not derived from previous knowledge, but it's a gift? But listen to Van Til and Banson now saying that the Bible would be merely in a vacuum. It would be useless if we didn't have the knowledge of God in us already. That the power of the word actually relies upon something in man, and that the Spirit of God cannot convince people purely based upon the power and the authority of the Scriptures. No, that's not enough, according to Banson and Van Til. Something more is needed. There is a sense in which all men have faith, and all men know God. This point is of the utmost importance for Christian apologetics. It alone offers a point of contact with the mind and heart of natural man. For the moment, it may suffice to stress the fact that the Bible itself would come to man in a vacuum, and its whole claim would be without meaning, except for the assumption that all the facts of the universe, including man himself, are revelational of God. We must assume that men are already familiar with God when they encounter the world or his word. They come to their experiences prepared to recognize the indications in nature and scripture as indications of God. Such preconditioning is necessary in all cases of direct, non-inferential knowing. Really? Don't Banson and Van Til sound like Roman Catholics? If you're talking to a Roman Catholic, you'll hear them say that the Bible would be in a vacuum if it wasn't for the Pope and the Church to interpret it for us. So we couldn't understand the meaning of it without the Church and the Pope. But Banson and Van Til say that we need the knowledge within us in order to know how to interpret the Bible. That without something in us, the Bible would be useless. It would be in a vacuum. Now, they're only right in one sense. God does use our ideas, the ideas we have before we're converted. However, he uses them to show us that he is the opposite of what we are by nature. We are constantly changing. God tells us he does not change. Or, for example, Paul, when before he was converted, he was, a seeking, he was seeking a righteousness of his own. But Paul was shown by God that Christ is the end of law for righteousness, that God does not need the righteousness of man, that the righteousness of Christ is sufficient. Every time we see God showing the exact opposite. But next up, I want to deal with a passage which a lot of people say goes to show that man has truth in him by nature. I'm talking about Romans 2, 14 to 15. Before we look at verse 14, let's talk about verse 13. 
for not the hearers of the law are just with God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, all the Protestant Reformed Calvinistic writers I know of, John Calvin, John Murray, etc., they all say this verse is hypothetical. That Paul is trying to convict men of sin. Paul's saying, if someone was to be justified apart from Christ, they'd have to do the law. It wouldn't be enough to hear the law, you'd have to do it as well. I totally agree with them. But verse 14, which starts in a similar way, for another argument from Paul. If P, then Q. For when nations not having law, by nature do the things of the law. Now, is Paul suddenly ending his argument? Is he no longer trying to convict men of sin? Is he now saying that men actually do the law by nature? No, Paul is clearly arguing hypothetically in verse 14. Whenever nations not having the law by nature do the things of the law. Strong's definition says, the Greek hotan, whenever implying hypothesis or more or less uncertainty. And at the end there you can see, whensoever or while. Now, a lot of people will get very angry and say that scripture cannot be hypothetical if it says, whenever nations not having the law by nature do the things of the law, it must be implying that it's possible or there has been cases of people in nations doing the law by nature. But this is a logical fallacy, as Jesus points out in John 21. Speaking to Peter, he says, If I desire John to remain until I come, what is that to you? In other words, if John's going to stay with me and not see death, what is that to you? And verse 23, Therefore the word went out to the brothers that the disciple does not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he does not die. But if I desire, if I desire him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Christ throws out a hypothetical. If I wanted John to not die, what's that to you? People concluded from an if that it was possible or it was going to be the case that John would not die. That's what was a logical fallacy as pointed out by Christ. He was merely saying, if P, then Q. He was not necessarily saying P is true, P is going to happen, or Q is going to happen. In fact, scripture is littered with hypotheticals. John 8, 55, if I say I do not know the Father, I would have been to you a liar. Now, could Christ ever have been a liar? No, it was never possible that the Son of God would stray from the law. John 16, verse 7, For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come. Again, that was not a possibility. It was merely a way of arguing. John 14, 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places, but if it were not so, I would have not told it to you. Again, a hypothetical. If P, then Q, it does not imply that P or Q are possible. Uh, actually so. It's just a way of reasoning to convince men of the truth. Of showing men the impossibility of the contrary. Now, let's look at those two words, by nature. What did Paul mean? Let's take a look at Galatians 2.15. We Jews by nature and not sinners of the nations. What was the difference between Jews and Gentiles? It wasn't their physical makeup or their genetics. It was their customs. It was their societies. It was their culture. Have a look at Romans 2.27. Paul wrote to the Jews, And will not the uncircumcision by nature, by completing the law, judge you? If a Gentile obeyed the law perfectly, he would certainly condemn the Jews, Paul says. There is equality b between the two races. But now think about it. All Jews were uncircumcised when they came into the world. They were physically uncircumcised. So when it says Gentiles are uncircumcised by nature, it must be referring to the customs. It must be referring to the society. It was an uncircumcised society that didn't obey the law of Moses. The sentence would be redundant if Paul said Jews, because Jews were uncircumcised naturally as well. They had to be circumcised. So it must mean uncircumcision by culture. That was the key difference between the two. Finally, We'll have a quick look at the word, word order of Romans 2.14. Whenever the Gentiles, the ones not the law having by nature, the things of the Lord do. Notice the word do is at the end of the sentence. Most translations put it in the middle of the sentence. But in the Greek, it's at the end. Most translations have, when the Gentiles, not the law having do by nature the law, and make it sound like Gentiles do the law by nature. But is this scriptural? Isn't Paul trying to convict men of sin? Doesn't the verse before verse 13, not the hearer of the law, but the doer of the law shall be justified? Isn't that also hypothetical? Isn't Paul trying to say you must obey the entire law and show men the impossibility of doing so, that they needed Christ's righteousness? What do you think?